Amen. We have been studying in the book of Revelation, and we are in chapter 11, and we are, are going to pick up this week at verse 14 and 15 and talk about the coming of the Lord. I want to read to you, verse 14 says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Verse 15 says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. There's three things when I think about the coming of the Lord. Three things I think about. First is what people call the rapture. And the word rapture is not in the Bible, but it, it is referring to the catching away of the saints. Other places it's called the first resurrection. And so I, I want to uh, read you 1 Corinthians 15, 51. This is important to the saints because this is what we look forward to. 1 Corinthians 15, starting at 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this, 53 says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 54 says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. I like this passage because in particular, it talks about the last trump. And as we're studying here in Revelation 11, this is the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and that is the last trump. That tells me that that is when it's going to take place. And um, mortal is subject to death, but immortal means that you're not subject to death and you will live forever. Corruption is what you see as you age, and also when people are placed in their graves, their death begins the uh, corruption as in from dust to dust. You were God created Adam out of the dust and we're going to return to the dust. That's corruption, right. And when you put on incorruption, means those former things are passed away and we are no longer subject to those things. I praise the Lord for that. With this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, I also think about 1 Thessalonians and chapter 4. So I want to turn over there because often when you're at funerals, you'll hear this passage preached. Uh, at the death of a saint. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and beginning at verse uh, 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. asleep sleep is a word that is used for death in many passages. It says that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. 14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That's good news. If you've been lost loved ones, you know that you're going to meet them again because you're going to see them with Jesus. Verse 15 says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Verse 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ 
shall rise first. 17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 18 says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It is a comfort. I like these passages. Uh, Revelation 20. I want to bring out that because it talks about the first resurrection there. Revelation 20, and I'll read you verses 4 and 5. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Praise the Lord. I'll read you verse 6 also. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death, and I want you to know that if you look at the end of that chapter, it'll tell you the second death is the lake of fire. It says, The second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's good news. Very good news. I'm turning back here in uh, Revelation chapter 11. We studied last week, and, and verse 12, uh, when it says, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. When we were talking about that last week, I told you that I believe that that also is talking about that first resurrection, that catching away, being caught up to meet the Lord. The second thing that I, I think about when I think of the Lord's coming is the destruction of the wicked. Now, the uh, verse 14 said, uh, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe comes quickly. A woe is a bad thing, and the bad thing is for the wicked. I, I just want you to understand that, because in verse 18, uh, it says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great. And the other part it says, And shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. There's a reward for the saints and the prophets, right? But, there is destruction that he should destroy them which destroy the earth. Okay, uh, when I see this and I turn the pages over into chapter 17, Revelation 17, I look at verses 12 to 14. It says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Verse 13 says, These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. 14 says, These shall make war with the lamb. That's Jesus. Jesus is the lamb. And the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords, and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Do you see that? Okay, in verse uh, chapter 19, uh, let me read to you. Uh, this is probably foremost in, in the pictures of Jesus coming. Revelation 19 and 11, it says, I saw heaven open, 
and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The ones that he's making war with are the ones that we just read about in Revelation 11, the ones that destroy the earth. He's going to destroy them. Verse 12 says, His eyes were as flame of fire, on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he, he himself. 13 says, He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. 14 says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. 15 says, And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Uh, I'm just going to leave it right there. It, because there's a war that's happening at the coming of the Lord, and it's referring to the destruction of the wicked. Okay, the other thing that I think about of the coming of the Lord is that we see that millennial reign begin, that kingdom that occurs here on earth. And um, so Matthew 19, 28 is one verse that comes to my mind. Um, Matthew... 1928 says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now that uh, throne of glory is what he's talking about there when he at his coming i i think about daniel chapter 2 and verse uh, 44 it says and in the days of these kings shall the god of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever that's talking about the coming of our Lord. One more passage. I, I could bring out more, but what I wanted to bring out was that in Revelation 21, you have that picture of uh, the new Jerusalem coming down. Uh, Revelation 21, it says, uh, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And verse 2, it says, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You see that? that there, that's really talking, this whole chapter is um, talking about what will occur when that kingdom is established. Um, verse 10 is kind of a repeat of what we just read in verse 2, where he said, I saw John, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Look at verse 10. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Do you see that? And then it just begins to describe her as having the glory of God in verse 11. And um, I'm not going to go and read it all. I just want you to realize that that whole chapter is describing where I place my hope in spending my eternity. I want to be there. So um, when I think about the coming of the Lord, I think about the rapture, I think about the destruction of the wicked, and then 
I think about the millennial reign and what will happen there. Any questions before we go on? Okay. Now, I'm going back into Revelation chapter 11 and verse 16 here is a throne room. Um, if you've been with us through these studies, you will notice that there are multiple throne room visions. You see it in Revelation 4, 4, 4, chapter 10, 11, uh, you, you just, um, Revelation 5, Revelation 7, Revelation 14, Revelation 15. There's multiple throne room visions. So as we read this in 16, Revelation 11, 16, it says, and the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon the fa their faces and worshipped God. In the throne room, that is a place of worship. A, a place of worship. And verse 17 says, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. Do you see how that goes along with the coming of the Lord? And that this is his reign. He's reigning. Uh, when I see that which art and was and art to come, and it calls him Lord God Almighty, if you look in the very first chapter of Revelation, Revelation 1, 8, it says, this is Jesus speaking, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Do you see the connection between those two verses there? And verse 18, it says, The nations were angry, and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should shouldest destroy them which destroyed the earth. I read this passage just a little while ago when I was talking about the destruction of the wicked, but it's also a time for the reward of the righteous, the saints. And, I'm sure it's a time of judgment and a time of, or a time of wrath going out and rewards. That's right. That's right. Which group you want to be in. Absolutely. Where I want to be. The choice is yours. Yes. You decide. You decide now where you will spend eternity. What are you going to do with this life that God has given you? Which side are you on? The last verse there in Revelation 11, verse 19, it says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. There is um, a few passages I want to talk to you about here in the temple of God. I want to go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And um, verses 1 through 5, it says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, 
which is called the sanctuary. Verse 3 says, And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, verse 4 says, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. Now that tells you what was in the ark. And then in verse 5 it says it was overshadowed over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot speak, now speak particularly. I wanted to go to you um, in the chapter before, Hebrews chapter 8, and look at verse 5. It says, Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for it says, Seeth, saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. When Moses went up on the mountain, God, in my mind, took him to heaven and showed him all these things that are in heaven because that's how the patterns were supposed to be made. And if you look in Hebrews 9, it says in verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven, you see the patterns of things, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. And it talks about um, verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now, you know, they've lost track, and I say they, through, through time, that ark that was prepared according to Moses, uh, the pattern, it was lost. And I don't know that I, I hear, well, they found it or they'll make another. I don't know, but I'll tell you there's one in heaven. And I know that because I can see in here, in verse 19, the temple of God was open in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And then it also it says, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. This is another thing. That portion where it talks about lightnings, voices, thunderings, and earthquake and great hail is mentioned numerous times about the throne. You could look at Revelation 4, chapter 4, verse 5, chapter 8, verse 5. In chapter 16 and verse 8, along with this passage, there's at least four times that talk about the lightnings and voices and thunderings, earthquake and great hail, when, when that happens. Do you see that? A another thing, uh, before we go on into Revelation 12, I want you to realize that as you look through um, the book of Revelation, there's not a time order here. You cannot think that at your, as you're reading that this is happening and then this happens and then this happens, like in a sequence, like first this, second, third. No, because things are stated and restated and stated again multiple times. So please don't think to yourself, well, this is all this is going to happen, and this is going to happen again, and then, then it's happening again, and, and that's not how it is. Um, if you don't have any questions, we're going to go ahead on into Revelation 12. Is that okay? It, it talks in here in the very first verse. I'll read you verse 1 and verse 2 about, And there appeared... A great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun 
and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. I want you to realize that this is symbolic. Now, we should be used to symbolism this far. As you're looking through here at the very first chapter, Revelation 1.20, it says, The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are seven churches. When I talk about symbolism, when I hear candlesticks, I'm thinking about the church. And when I hear about stars in my mind, I think about angels. That's symbolism. Uh, looking at this sun-clothed woman, she has um, the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars. The first time that I see this passage is in Genesis 37, and it's talking about Joseph. Joseph was one of the sons of, of Jacob. And Jacob, you know, his name was changed to Israel. And so Israel's sons are called the 12 tribes. Though Each one of those sons represented a, a tribe of uh, Israel. But if I look here in Genesis 37, I'll read you verse 9 and 10. And it says, And he dreamed yet another dream, and behold, and told it his, his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeyance to me. Verse 10, And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? Now, why do I connect this? Because very often in Scripture you see a type and a shadow of something else. Kind of like when Abraham took Isaac up on the mount, you, you know, uh, the Lord told him to get up there and offer his only son. Well, you know, that connects with John 3, 16, for the Lord, God so loved the, the, the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's, there's a shadowing there. Abraham literally took Isaac up there, and Isaac said to his father, Look, father, uh, I see the wood, I see the fire, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham told him that God would provide himself a burnt offering. He would provide the sacrifice. And so that is a shadowing of something that was to come. This also here in Genesis 37, this really did happen. And we do see the fulfillment of this in the land of Egypt because Joseph was sold by his brother, and they carried him down there to be a slave. The rest of the story is that um, he was raised up to be Pharaoh's right-hand man, and that he was over all the country and all that Pharaoh had, and his father and his brethren did come and bow down before him, and he took care of them. There's a shadowing there. Do you see that? In scripture, the, the part about the sun, the moon, and the stars, I want to uh, just talk about that a little bit because this is um, an allegory. In, in other words, I'm going to take you over into Galatians chapter 4 because Galatians use that word allegory. Uh, which means that this happened, but it's really pointing to something else. It's kind of like Jesus in the Gospels. He spoke to the people in parables. 
And often the disciples said, uh, could you tell us the meaning of that parable? The story that Jesus told had a meaning, right? Uh, if you go to Matthew 13, you're going to see the sower of the seed. And he also declares it. He talks about the wheat and the tares. Both of those, he tells them the meaning of it. 